Welcome to MENA Dialogues, a series of interviews with leading scholars, artists, and writers produced by the Middle East and North African Studies Program at Northwestern University. This installment of MENA Dialogues features a conversation with two of Morocco's most prominent intellectual figures, the political scientist Abdelhai Moudin and the playwright, novelist, and editor Dries Kasikis. The host is MENA director Brian Edwards. Abdelhai Moudin is professor of political science at Mohammed V University in Rabat and the founder and academic director of the Center for Cross-Cultural Learning in Morocco. He has been a member of Morocco's National Human Rights Council and of the country's Equity and Reconciliation Commission. Dries Ksikis has been called one of the most innovative writers in Morocco today and was named one of the six best African playwrights by the National Studio Theatre in London. He's the author of numerous plays, novels, and essays, and the editor-in-chief of the journal Economia. He was a visiting writer-in-residence at Northwestern for the spring quarter of 2017. Brian Edwards is Crown Professor in Middle East Studies and Director of the MENA program at Northwestern University. He is the author of Morocco Bound, Disorienting America's Maghreb from Casablanca to the Marrakesh Express and After the American Century, The Ends of U.S. Culture in the Middle East. This conversation took place on May 15th, 2017, at Northwestern University. Uh, Abdelhai Mouden, Dries Ksikas, thank you for joining us for MENA Dialogues. Um, We had a uh, wonderful conversation yesterday on MENA Monday, and we're leading up to a symposium on Thursday uh, called Moroccan Exceptionalism, Uh, at which both of you will speak along with other scholars. So we wanted to talk through uh, in this interview the idea of exceptionalism uh, with respect to Morocco, if it's a worthy idea, if it's something worth pursuing or how it's provocative, uh, and also to give us a a report on how political and social conditions in Morocco today, uh, more than five years after the so-called Arab uprising, six years now. Um, so, Abdelhai, um, first of all, I would like to start with you. If this term, uh, Moroccan exceptionalism in English, which can refer to a couple of words in Arabic that are in use, uh, istithna uh, and khususiya, um, if you could give us a sense of whether you think it's a, a productive term or what it, how it resonates for you in thinking about what's particular about the Moroccan case. Well, as an analytical term in social science, it is not actually helpful because it sets a certain country or a certain situation outside of the norms. So in that case, it will be a situation that doesn't fit a generalization, a theory, or a paradigm. From that perspective, it is not that helpful. However, as a question, it is helpful in trying to locate what are some of the characteristics in a particular country like Morocco that distinguishes it from other experiences and from other uh, historical trends that have occurred elsewhere. And from that perspective, I found that the question of exceptionalism opens us to compare Moroccan exceptionalism to so many other cases of exceptionalism that we find around the world, including French exceptionalism, the American exceptionalism, and yeah, others. No, as you said uh, yesterday, for social scientists uh, and for scholarship in general, except to be ex- everything is exceptional in a sense. There's a particularity, which is what Khosusia gets at in Arabic. Um, and yet, uh, there's, there seems to be certain ways in which talking about or thinking about Morocco within the multiple regions that it pertains to, the Arab world, Muslim country world, Africa, Mediterranean, that there seems something particular. What, when Moroccans use this term, istidna, to refer to Morocco, what do they mean? Well, Moroccan, there is an entire local or indigenous discourse about exceptionalism, which some of it is related to 
uh, or voiced by politicians. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the state or the officials would like to speak about Moroccan exceptionalism that is different from where Morocco is uh, stable, where Morocco is uh, stable because it is legitimate, where the country has uh, uh, a long history of continuity and longevity, and therefore it is another indication of its legitimacy. Uh, where Morocco, although it was, a, it was never a part of uh, uh, the domination of big empires, such as the Ottoman Empire, or even when it was colonized, it was one of the shortest moments of uh, colonial experiences. So all this is celebrated uh, within, a discourse of a, within a discourse of nationalism, mm -hmm. that Morocco is unique, which we find in almost every country celebrates its, its uh, uniqueness. There is another uh, um, interesting uh, significance in the indigenous discourse about, uh, about Moroccan exceptionalism, which sets itself against the Orientalist discourse about the Muslim exception, where Morocco is a part, and the Muslim uh, exception, or sometimes it is also the Arab exception, it is um, a culture, it is a civilization, or it is a group of countries that don't uh, that don't uh, improve, and that uh, don't change, that, that are stagnant, mm -hmm. or that were never a nation state. And the uh, emergence of the Moroccan social science and humanities and history was a reaction against this Orientalist discourse where the Moroccan intellectuals or academics have been emphasizing that Morocco has existed for a long period of time as a nation, and therefore it was not the creation of the colonialism. So if there was an Orientalist discourse in which Muslim exceptionalism put the quote-unquote Muslim world outside of the norms of the West, as you put it, Morocco could be an exception to the exception in the sense that it was different from other parts of the Arab uh, and Muslim majority. Yeah, here is where some of the Orientalist discourse about exceptionalism, because this is also another version of Orientalist discourse, where Morocco is not a part of the Muslim, is an exception to the Muslim exception, yet it is not, uh, it is not a normal right. situation. Right. It is not Western. Uh, someone said, like, it is uh, white, but not quite. Uh, however, in the Moroccan uh, uh, critique of the, Orient, uh, of the Orientalist and uh, exceptionalism and emphasis on the Moroccan exception, it is that Morocco is close to the model of a nation state that existed in the West, and therefore it is closer to uh, the, uh, the, the norm of a nation state that has existed in Europe and likewise it existed in Morocco. Uh, Dries, uh, Ksikis, the, the continuities that Abdelhai refers to, the fact that Morocco's relationship to the Middle East uprisings and Arab uprisings was a bit different, um, drew the attention of many commentators in the U.S. People would ask or notice that Morocco did not seem to go through its own major period of tumult around 2011. Um, what's your sense of how activism or uh, this continuity function within the, the Moroccan contemporary scene um, well, for, first, just just to 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 talk about this question of exceptionalism yeah. from Moroccan point of view, because it's a discourse produced by the elite within within Morocco for a long time. Mm -hmm. It is produced first to say, well, we we are the West of Islam. We are not the East of Islam. So that's that, the, and that we are we are apart. That's one thing. Second thing that we ha are historically an empire linked to sub-Saharan uh, Africa. So that's a, another point that has been used by uh, jurists and political scientists and in order to explain the legitimacy of, of power. A lot of discourses have been produced by el the elite on exceptional. Also the question of security, stability, all these questions. Now, when, when there is eruption of mass prote protests or manifestation, there, in a certain sense, there are they break the question of exceptionalism because you seem alike other other countries. I mean, uh, the, the, what happened in 2011 was certainly a continuity of Tunisian and Egypt uh, and Egyptian uh, upheavals. Now, it's the tactics, the strategies of how to to uh, to absorb uh, people's anger that is very specific and very exceptional then, which is the tactics of either uh, corruption, repression, uh, more, 
more uh, saloon discussions on reform rather than discussions on the streets, on the public sphere. So the whole question of how Morocco has, the, uh, Moroccan officials and Moroccan elites have, have managed to uh, absorb this is very interesting to look at. One, uh, one European, um, very prominent MP came once to Morocco and he was asked, what ha how come you're not uh, criticizing Morocco as you're doing with other countries in the region? He said, you know, Morocco is, uh, is on fire, but it's not really boiling uh, as others are. So in a certain sense, Morocco is looked at as exceptional by comparison also. That's, that's also another point of view of how after 2011, it has been looked upon as a country that should be taken apart also from, from all this. So there are strategies of the power, the, the, the officials, strategies of funders uh, fr from Europe, uh, and strategies of political actors within Morocco that are very consensual because they're not, they, they don't take part into a democratic uh, contest for power. They are rather seeking to be closer to the palace decision making, which makes them sometimes closer to the, to the circles of decision and taking distance with, uh, with representation. So all these elements have to be taken into consideration. Now, Dries, as a, as a magazine editor, as a former magazine editor and current new magazine editor uh, and an observer of the Moroccan social scene, the first decade of the 21st century was one in which many debates uh, were taking place, social debates, political debates within Morocco. 2011 seems to be a, a turning point. How would you compare the first decade and the second decade of this century in Morocco? Is it, are those conversations that were so vibrant in the first decade of the century still happening? Where the, did the political situation change dramatically with the Arab uprisings and Arab, so-called Arab Spring? No, I would say that the Arab uprisings, are, have you, this was maybe, we had one year of uh, a situation between brackets that was seen to be changing, and then we came back to the initial situation. The initial situation started changing, starting from 2003. Actually, uh, in order to understand the situation in Morocco, you have to go back to 19, the mid-90s, at the end of the reign of Hassan II. Then there was a sense that we should open up more to, for a more liberal, maybe liberal pol pol political scene in Morocco, and more freedom of expression, etc. But this was useful for some time on transition and the new reign and also uh, a new elite coming and, and, and seeking for more, more, more freedom. But then the, the, the power at stake, the, the, balance, the balance of powers at stake didn't allow for this freedom to, to be uh, maintained and there was return of limits not only from above, but also from the actors themselves ex accepting more self-censorship. One would think that with the advent of uh, internet, uh, news online, that there will be uh, much more liberty. Actually, the economics of media in Morocco don't allow for more liberty because we don't have strong corporates of news. We don't have enough public debates in the public sphere. We don't have enough places of freedom of expression. So the, the margins of liberty that some people are taking are all the time risky because the, the political economy of the media is very constraining. Now you have a, uh, a new article in the Journal of North African Studies on Moroccan media and you're teaching here a course on North African literature in the age of social media. Um, what did you, how important do you think the advent of digital technologies, new social media, is to addressing these kinds of censorship uh, or self-censorship and the, the, the ways in which the marketplace limits expression within Morocco? Well, you know, the, the fact that we have today something like 8 
eight million Facebookers in, in Morocco. And that's the digital media are totaling something like 3 million, 3.5 million visitors. Means that actually uh, in digital world we're competing the broadcasts, the, the national broadcasts. The, that's, the, that's a new, a new element. The whole thing is that uh, the production of what is there in digital media is more of miscellaneous news, uh, very few investigation, very few uh, huge reports. There is a lot of voicing, there are lots of voicing of people, a lot of expression, in, uh, very a lot of testimonies, a lot of uh, a, a lot of uh, different facts coming from society. Maybe we're getting more aware of the diversity w of expression within society, but we don't have, unfortunately, enough access to major information and major data because there is at the same time limited access to information. So even if we have this huge amount of uh, users and a lot of expression, uh, th th this is creating more tension on social taboos, maybe on some economic points, a lot of uh, more pressure. Uh, sometimes there, there are even some reforms that could be triggered by the voice of people on on, on the digital world, but all this is still very feeble and very weak because there isn't access to major information that are, uh, s uh, I mean, structuring the the the, the, the public the public the public sphere. Abdelhai, uh, you have published you know, on this question of emotions uh, and the the ways in which social media have allowed the world and Moroccans to see the testimonies of other Moroccans. You have a very interesting article published last year with uh, Tayyip Belkhazi on Ihbat, what you call Ihbat, the kind of sense of disillusionment after the Arab uprisings. Um, what's your sense of the emotional kind of uh, uh, sentiments or the kind of feeling that you're, get, that you're getting at with, with this analysis? Uh, well, we have realized that uh, in social science and in political science in particular, emotions have been downplayed, where politics has been analyzed as the product of rational choice, rational reasoning, rational calculations. But the, actually, the emotions play an extremely important role in how people behave, how people think, how people uh, understand their or position themselves. And therefore, uh, we looked at the Arab Spring uh, in the case of Morocco, but we might even generalize it to other cases as well, as two moments. One is a euphoric moment where the young people went to the streets and start, started chanting slogans that actually were celebrating the free will of the people that are in face of uh, authoritarian, authoritarian regimes. And all of a sudden there was some kind of a euphoric moment where people were, wait, were celebrating that the change that they were waiting for and never happened. Some articles were talking about uh, waiting for Godot in the Middle East and the Arab world, which doesn't come, referring to democracy that doesn't happen. So this was a euphoric moment. And then it was followed by a moment of disillusionment. And this moment of disillusionment was associated with the notion that those who were celebrating change, who were voicing the voice of the people, were actually not doing what would be politics. They were celebrating that the people are in power, but they were doing it on the streets. And when they were doing it on the streets, the major difference, which some would associate with the Moroccan exception, is that in the case of Morocco, the protests happened in many places, and they happened in peace, with minimum level of repression. And I think that this was what has contributed in a smooth uh, in a smooth management of the political crisis according to the state that was that happened uh, as a result of the of the Arab Spring so the disillusionment was a moment when people realized that they are not going to move from one position to another from one poly regime type to another and then they have to learn from their what would be called a uh, the political the inability to produce change by protest only now, the uh, question is how that emotions play into electoral politics. There was 
elections in October of 2016 and just last month in April of 2017, a new government was formed. Can you see some of the effects of this emotional shift in the new government that was elected and, and put together? To a large extent, I think that we in Morocco, like uh, probably uh, other countries, other or like democracies, we are realizing that uh, the change doesn't happen. And I think that the solution that we are referring to in the case of Morocco could be generalized in the sense that the utopian change that we associate with elections doesn't happen. That as soon as you have no cabinet and no leaders, then what you were expecting to take place doesn't happen and you try to manage or you try to live with your disillusionment. Similarly, in the case of Morocco, again, something that is also considered an exceptional condition in Morocco is that this is now the only Arab country that has elected an Islamist party and has lasted. In Egypt, it happened as a result of uh, a revolution, likewise in, uh, in, in Tunisia. But in both cases, the Islamists were ousted or marginalized, whereas in Morocco, they were elected in 2011 and then re-elected again in 2016. Although their political power is to a large extent curtailed and limited by the omnipresence of the, of the, of the state and of the, of the monarchy. So the disillusionment is, again, at, uh, the, uh, the feeling of the fact that elections don't produce the expected change. And, but I have the impression that rather than producing some kind of a radicalism, uh, it also produces the, uh, the, the acceptance of a situation. And maybe next generations might deal with their disillusionment in a different way. Now, I want to turn to uh, talk a little bit about migration and the, the ways in which um, uh, migration from sub-Saharan Africa through Morocco or to Morocco and to Europe, and also the Syrian refugees that one starts to notice, at least when I was in Morocco in December, you started to notice a real change uh, as well in some of the urban centers are affecting Morocco. Morocco, of course, at the crossroads of many of continents and of, of bodies of water where the Mediterranean meets the Atlantic and where Africa meets uh, Europe uh, has always been marked by the crossing of peoples. Um, how can we think about the, the, the new pressures that are put on Morocco from these two migration patterns? Um, I also want to ask about Morocco historically rejoining the African Union and whether that's related at all to one of these sets of migrations. Well, the migration of the uh, sub-Saharan Africans to Morocco has uh, uh, always existed, the, the, uh, but with the closure and with the strict control over the borders in, uh, to Europe, we are ending up having an increasingly a large uh, sub-Saharan population that is becoming a part of our daily lives. And of course, if you add uh, the migration, the rising number of immigrants to, uh, from sub-Saharan Africa and uh, to, to a lesser extent from, uh, from Syria to the poor conditions, to the high level of unemployment, you can imagine the kind of uh, the situation or uh, the, the problems that, uh, that, uh, that, that generate. However, because of um, what you mentioned, uh, Morocco's decision to rejoin uh, uh, the African Union since it uh, left it in a uh, um, sign of anger against the African countries who have recognized the uh, Western Sahara, uh, um, the, the Polisario, or the Rast even, as, uh, as, uh, which Morocco considers to be a separatist movement and as an illegitimate entity, Morocco has decided to change its policy and to re-enter the, uh, the African Union in order to uh, find another uh, uh, way of uh, defending what it considers to be the national interest and the, uh, the, the integrity of the country. And because of that, there are a number of uh, gestures by the Moroccans towards the African state in the form of investment, visits by the king for the first time to a number of non-French-speaking African countries, and also by providing some job opportunities and the legalization of a number of uh, sub-Saharan African immigrants in Morocco. Uh, for the Syrians, it is also Morocco is the farthest Arab country from the far, from from the Middle East. But in spite of that, we do have a number of Syrians coming, and there is also some attempt by Morocco to utilize the Syrian 
uh, refugees in its competition with Algeria, who among the two countries is the most generous towards the Syrians. So while there is these issues of uh, immigration and uh, the problems associated with that, there is also the, the use of the immigration from Sub-Sahara or from the Middle East in order to, in the, in the competition between Morocco and Algeria for the support and uh, for the sympathy of either Sub-Saharan Africans or the Syrians and other Arab countries. I want to, as a final kind of strand, start talking about the cultural scene, literary and cultural scene. Of course, you're a playwright and novelist, um, and we're featuring some of your own playwriting here in, at Northwestern and in, in Chicago. Um, what are some of the, the uh, trends within literary and cinematic and cultural scene within Morocco? Um, do you find a, a break or a continuity from the last decades within the new writing uh, and filmmaking coming out of Morocco in the last decade? Well, I, I think that uh, actually it's in the cultural and artistic scene that we can see uh, in a certain sense a will of uh, uh, change of aesthetics, uh, expressing, expressing an ethical concern with the collectivity in a different way. A lot of, a lot of work, for example, in cinema on the years of lead but now, uh, w w w which are the, the years of uh, uh, torture and repression in years Morocco, of yeah, years of lead, yeah. yeah, years of lead, and you, you, for example, you've got in cinema someone like Hisham Lasri, uh, or you've got you've got other uh, other people uh, who are trying to find new aesthetic ways of de t telling their concerns about these questions. You've got the the the, the, the return of the question of the body. Uh, and the expression of, uh, of, of the body within the public sphere, and then it's going through theater, but also through festivals of dance in, 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 in street theater that, that is there. You've got also the question of memory that is re revisited in a different way in order to understand better uh, the, 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 where, we can, where the reform uh, started or, or not. And I think that's the, the, the one other one other major major question that is uh, coming in the artistic and cultural scene is also the question of debates about uh, about how to live together the, the, the le vivre ensemble the, this question of living together you've got it in public debates of philosophy of zinka this philosophy at the streets young people discussing you find it in uh, people who are discussing on literature, on, on art. The, the, the only thing is that all these settings are still marginal because they are the will of actors, of civic actors, uh, not enough venues, not enough ritualization of these uh, questions within the public sphere, within the education system, within the, within the mainstream media. So. It shows that there is some dynamics coming from the will of actors, but not, not enough influence within the public sphere of these questions. And finally, you know, you, you hosted a conference in Rabat uh, in, in the winter uh, on Fatima Mernisi, the great scholar, feminist, sociologist, um, who is well known in the United States. You made the point that Mernisi is time maybe to, may, we may want to reinvestigate her work could you say more about that, specifically around the question of feminism, gender studies, sexuality, uh, and religion? Yeah, I, I, I'm uh, with uh, Mukhtar al Harras, we're both of us the coordinators of the chair of Fatima Mernisi, which is hosted by the Sezem Ashem Research Center and the Faculty of Letters of the University of Mohammed V in Rabat. We, our, our main interest in uh, creating this chair is to go on on discuss, discussing gender, not only as such, but in relationship with democracy, which is a big question in uh, Fatima Mernese's heritage. I mean, she's not considered concerned only by uh, patriarchy, but also by autocracy as something that is uh, taking away the, the, the question of, of, of uh, women's take in, in public sphere and heritage. Uh, second, our interest in question of youth and, and globalization and 
how your, uh, the voice of yours could be more heard. She's been working a lot on how to make, to make this uh, more uh, clear. And also, we're taking further something that she started on uh, underground market and uh, social initiative. Uh, she's been working a lot on very rural or urban uh, underground markets because the fragility of society is something that is creating at the same time a very shaky, stable situation. So all these questions, we're taking them further by scholarships, by fellowships, and by research uh, programs, and also by creating mixture between artistic, artistic projects and research projects. That's great. Well, thank you for taking the time to show us uh, and remind us just how dynamic the Moroccan social political scene is. It's something that uh, is endlessly fascinating, important for American scholars, students, and, and citizens to know about. So thank you for taking the time to talk uh, with Mina Dialogues today.